Hello everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Breaking Bike Podcast UK. Today we're here with Phil Stark. Phil was a screenwriter in Hollywood, res- uh, responsible for Dude, Where's My Car, which is a very cool film. That's such a cool thing that you, you can say that you were part of. Um, and That 70s Show, which I've looked at. I hadn't heard of it before, but obviously a very, very big show, to be fair. I didn't realise... Um, is it like a remake of something? That's what I got from the re. No, it, it's a little bit of a retro show. It was produced in the ninety, well, starting late nineties, two thousands, but it was set in the seventies. So it's sort of like a Happy Days thing, a retro oh. show set in the past. And also, which is pretty cool, Dog with a Blog, just because I watched that when I was growing up. So that's that's really cool. Oh, really? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. That's good. Um. Yeah, we, we can get into all that. And now Phil is a therapist and marriage counsellor. So retrained, or not retrained, but trained as a therapist, got your master's, and you're now a therapist. And that's obviously, I'm interested to talk to you about both of those avenues. So um, thank you for doing this. Dog show. with a blog and therapy, the two main two main focus here. Perfect. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Those, those are the main things. No, is in no, no, is in the screenwriting and and the therapy. That's what I mean. Yeah, no, okay. no, sure, sure. But I have a good dog with a blog story. So remind me what we do. Okay, we'll do that. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dog with a blog, great idea. Um, yeah. So Phil, I'm going to ask the cliche question of how you got into uh, screenwriting because obviously that's where you started. And yeah, we'll do that bit. So how did you end up in Hollywood? Well, um. I always wanted to be a writer. I studied film at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, I moved to Los Angeles and got a job in a cafe and a cheap apartment, and I just wrote screenplay after screenplay. Uh, None of them were good or funny. Uh, Then a friend of mine who I went to school with said, Philly, you're a funny guy. I don't know why you're not writing comedies, right? Like a television show, television comedy. So I started to do that, and that's when I sort of realized that was more my uh, my area. And then the same friend uh, got me a job uh, as a PA on a pilot that was shooting. Uh, she was the assistant to the guys who were creating the show, and that show ended up being South. Wow. Oh, yes, that was the other one. I was very, yeah, I was very lucky to be in a position to to work on that show as a, as a post-production PA. I mean, I wasn't doing anything for you. I was driving from Westwood to Burbank and back with no air conditioning to delivering tapes. But uh, the guys knew through my friend who was their assistant that I was in writing. And eventually I sort of talked my way into being around the writers and then eventually finishing a script for one of them. And then I got like writing credit and then it just took off from there. So that that's my the short version of my origin story. And when was that? Was that late nineties? Uh, er, well, let's see. I think the seventy show. Well, let's see, South Park premiered. I think in either ninety six or ninety seven. Might have been ninety seven, but uh, certainly, but certainly in the previous uh, millennium. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, fair play. And why did you always want to be a writer? Where did that come from? Do you think? I don't know. I was always interested in film and creativity and, you know, sort of the artistic uh, approaches. Um, my, my father was a lawyer. He worked all the time. He always wore suits. It seemed boring and lame to me, and it was something that I became something to rebel against. And to me, that was going into the arts and to writing and poetry and filmmaking. And so uh, when I went to college, that's what I studied. And I wasn't really that into screenwriting until I graduated. And I think what attracted me to it was you could come up with an idea by yourself, sit down in a room, write it, do everything on your own that you needed and create a finished product on your own. I had schoolmates and colleagues who were really into production and filmmaking and directing, producing, but something about working with other people turned me off a little. And not literally about them, the people themselves, but more about the attraction to the idea of being able to sit down and have my own control over everything that I want okay, to yeah. come up with, you know, finished product. Ironically, which then the success of which is dependent on 
all these other people who are getting yeah. into the same mix. Would you consider yourself more introverted than extroverted? You know, I think I have a nice balance. Um, you certainly as I've gotten older, I've become more of an extrovert and able to talk. But but in terms of the introvert, I can appreciate like coming up with an idea and just wanting to sit and do it and create a world in your head. I think that's sort of an introvert kind of quality. Yes. They they say, don't they, that a film or I guess television program or whatever, anything is made three times. Oh, I've heard they, someone said it's made three times. It's made in like the pre-production, the production, and then the post-production. And what do you think it was that drew you to being involved in the pre-production aspect? Because you can sit and... Well, well, as a, as a, as a writer, you get to create your world. You get to tell your story. You get to be uh, the, the god of everything that's going to happen. And so you take full responsibility and you can create exactly what you want. Now... That's certainly different from a novelist or a poet and a screenwriter. Screenwriting is a real interesting bastardization of the, the role of the author as creator with the collaborative process and the reality of the business. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so it was interesting navigating those two dynamics because nobody wants to work with a screenwriter who only wants to hear what they think. Yeah. At the same time... Most producers and, and, and directors want to work with a screenwriter with a strong point of view who has created a world that they can then produce. Yeah, of course. That's one of the questions I asked Pilar, actually. I should have said that. That's how we got in contact through Pilar. She gave me your um, um, yeah. details and she said that, yes, Paul, uh, Phil even, is a great person to speak to. And I was like, cool, let's try it. And I asked, I said, when you yeah. write, or when you read, obviously, because she's a, an analysis, you're a writer, but when you read the scripts, do you, how much of a consideration do you have the fact that what, what is now a two-dimensional piece of paper is ultimately supposed to become a three-dimensional three -dimensional entity? And do you pander to that consideration or do you just say, no, screw that, I'm going to write down what I want it to be like and not think of the logistics well, well, the irony of the business is that oftentimes the beginning screen out will write what they see on the screen in front of them. They'll write what's popular, which which makes a lot of sense. You know, yep. the teen comedies are a trend. You might want to write a teen comic. But oftentimes producers really get excited about a script that has a very unique, specific point of view. Um, so the irony is they might be looking for somebody who's thinking outside of the box. Yep. But if they want to make the movie, you have to get inside the box. Hmm. Yeah. Do you, I was thinking last night I was watching a program and I was kind of like trying to conceptualize the difference between pro television programs and films. And this isn't, not, this is nothing original. I'm sure someone's thought of this, but a, a TV program is kind of like a book in the sense of each episode is a chapter and you can, you, you can be a lot more slow and drawn out with a television program, can't you? And you can build the narrative, etc. Whereas with a film, you've kind of got a, you know, when I watched Maze Runner yesterday, or the, maybe the day before, which is like, do you remember, make, sort of like, it's like a teen dystopia. And I was watching it, and I was yeah. thinking, came out like maybe 10 years ago, around the time that Hunger Games and Divergent, and that was all popular. And it's kind of, when you watch a film like that, there's kind of like a checklist of things that they have to feature. And it's sort of like, there's, it, and not saying that they're, copies of one another but there you have to you do things in a certain way in a, as you said a proven method but with a with a television series would you say you get more time I don't know how would you differentiate writing for a television series and writing for a film or do you think they're exactly the same well 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 films certainly have a beginning middle and an end yeah I mean it's very it's a enclosed story uh, television episodes often have a beginning, middle, and end, but overall, they're quite open-ended. Mm -hmm. uh, like a mini series like Shogun, which is on right now, which is based on a book, has a beginning, middle, and end. Uh, a show like that 70s show was designed to have each individual episode have a beginning, middle, and end, but overall, it just could, it's supposed to keep going. Yeah. Back when syndication was a big factor, you know, 20 years ago, the idea was to make 200 episodes. And just keep taking them out with the same characters and different story. Nowadays, I think it's a little different with the, you know, shows that might be like, for instance, Tokyo Vice, 
uh, which, you know, it does, what, 10 episodes for the first season, and then it might be over. Mm. But they got a second season. So then they're picking back up and, and, and continuing the story. So, so television is interesting in that episodes are unique in that they, they're individually meant to be uh, enjoyed, but they also have to fit into the overall arc of the series, which can maybe end after nine episodes or go for 200 episodes. You don't really know. Whereas a film, at least you know you have a certain runtime, beginning, middle, and end. It's a package and people will see it. Um, and then, you know, sequels, whatever, but it's meant to be, you know, enjoyed is Yes. And of course, nowadays, like episodes, what's really popular is television programs that almost are like mini films. Each episode is like, you know, 50. I imagine maybe, I mean, I don't know, but maybe 20 years ago, the average episode of a television program was a lot shorter than it is now. Now it's more, less number of episodes, but longer episodes. Whereas back yeah. then, it maybe was more episodes. You know, if you, I suppose that's a sitcom, isn't it? Is is was that seventies shows a, that seventies show a sitcom? Is that what it's yes. Called? Well, no. Yes, and the the reason for that change, I think, partly the business reality of it was that back in the nineteen eighties and nineties, syndication meant that if a producer produced two hundred episodes of Friends or a hit show, they would then retain the rights to that and then go and sell it to all these other local networks across the stage and internationally other markets who would want to show it. So whether it's somebody after school in Ohio watching the show or somebody in Spain mm. watching reruns of Friends for an hour, that was the way that people made money. So you wanted to make 200 episodes of something. And they had to be a little bit self-contained so people could fall in and out and watch it as they like. With the advent of streaming yeah. and the ability for people to watch whatever they want, whatever they want, the syndication market changed. So it's no longer to your advantage to produce 22 episodes of TV for a season because you're not going to get the payout of the syndication end. Now, if you were doing it just for a Netflix-style subscription service or an advertising-based kind of Bulu thing, whichever, uh, you don't have to make 25. Why not just make eight? Yeah, exactly. It's uh, I sp it's also, in theory, it's is it less production time if you do it that way? I don't know. I'm not sure. Maybe it's the same level. Yeah, well, absolutely. It, it just, it, 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 nowadays, you, people you don't want to make an investment in 25 episodes or something because there isn't the same kind of payout at the other end as there was back in the classic sitcom. How long were you writing for? Well, I was on South Park for a year, and then I went to that 70s show where I went for eight years. And during that time, I wrote several features, including Do the Burn My Car. Mm -hmm. And then after that 70s show, I spent a lot of time developing and pitching and writing pilots that didn't get made, what you would call development hell. Mm -hmm. And about, about 10 years of that, and then I decided that I was ready to do something. And that's when I became interested in psychology. Yeah, so let's let's talk about that. How did that arise? Well, uh, it's a common thing in the entertainment business for writers, directors, actors, anybody really, but mostly talent and the creative aspect of it to uh, have success, um, but but not enough success to maybe retire in that mm -hmm. position. So uh, there's nobody in this industry who says to you, "Hey, you know what? You had a good run." Maybe you should try to think about doing something else because you're not going to be an actor or a writer or producer until you retire. Maybe you need a second. So uh, I had a lot of success earlier in my career. Uh, and uh, towards the end of my career, I didn't have that much success. And I wasn't very happy. Hmm. But because I had had that success before, everybody around me was saying things like, well, you just keep writing until you did it before and you could do it again, yeah. which is very positive and supportive. And I appreciated that. Uh, but... The big litmus test for me was the fact that I wasn't enjoying it. I was sitting here writing pilots at home, developing shows, trying to pitch them, complaining about my agent not calling, reading the headlines about the demise of syndication, reality show taking over. I felt like a coal miner in Pittsburgh or the industrial center of the states back when people were shifting away from coal. But if all you know is coal, you're working in an industry that's dying. Yeah. And so that was a big thing for me, realizing I was unhappy. Then, trying to figure out, well, what would make me happy, which is a whole other slog. Um, and I'd always been interested in psychology, and I'd been in a, a therapy as a client my whole life. So I eventually, at first, I was like, I don't want to go to graduate school. I don't want to spend two years and the money and this and that, and what a waste. Eventually, it got to the point where I was like, you know, I'm ready to do that. And once I 
was ready to do that, it was very easy to pursue this uh, new thing that I was interested in. We can get to this later maybe, but when you said that you've been in therapy throughout your life, what was that? Was that just for like a general general sort of check-in or were there sort of... Uh, well, t- I think people often come to therapy because there are events in their lives that are becoming hard to handle. And we might call these phase of life issues. Uh, I work with clients who are uh, postgraduate as college age people who are struggling to find their identity and what they want to do with their life. And it's a common age to get really depressed because you don't know what you want to do or what you should be doing. Yeah. Um, people come to me uh, also when they uh, get married and start thinking about having kids because that can be a difficult transition. I also work with people who uh, are transitioning out of marriage who are thinking about getting divorced. Um, and uh, then people might also come to me if they have a loss of a loved one, they become very depressed. So these are what I would call phase of life issues that people come to therapy for, which was I did as well. Uh, get the help and support you need to guide you through this time. And then when you feel better, uh, you're ready to move on. Um, so that's, that's so when I say I was been in therapy my whole life, it hasn't been every every other Thursday for 45 years. Uh, it's been times in my life when I was struggling, needed help, got it from a therapist, and then got the tools I needed to then to go on with my life without. Yeah, and I think that I th- obviously some people need a percentage of people need consistent therapy, but I think if if you had to sort of describe the ideal therapeutic situation, it would be literally what you just said. It would be to go to see someone when you feel like you need an issue, when you, you're struggling with something, develop the tools that you need and then take them with you and then go on and, you know, if something else comes, then you go back. And I think that's a really healthy way of looking at therapy as opposed to just because you know I've had hence why I've set up the podcast podcast I've had a lot of anxiety in my life and I do people can definitely be over therapized and there's if you it's an incredibly difficult balance to work out like when you're going to see a therapist are they do I have practical things that need to be solved sometimes you sometimes it isn't a case of solving practical things sometimes you need to work things out and you need someone that is qualified and capable but sometimes I wonder if just talking about something to the ends sort of to the nth degree isn't helpful and you can you can become too sort of self-conscious and that cannot be conducive so would you say that I suppose that isn't really a question. That was just a statement based on you. I just thought it was really good that you said how you went and left and then, you know, come back and left. I thought that was really... Well, that that's important. You know, and as a therapist, I mean, oftentimes clients will come for therapy and they might get some help on an issue that they they needed it. And then they might even uh, discover another issue that they didn't realize that was important that they talked about. But it, oftentimes there's a certain point where it's like, well, what are we doing here? Kind right? of. Yeah. And sometimes the client is waiting for the therapist to say, hey, you're done. And sometimes the therapist is saying, man, I really like this client. I I, I, I hope he keeps coming to see me. Hopefully, yeah. Um, but I really try to make a point to check in with my clients about the therapy experience because if a client doesn't really want to be there or doesn't know what they're doing anymore, then it manifests in them skipping a session or being a little resentful in, in the room and, and not having a good session. So I always try to check in with my clients, which is hard because sometimes like I had a client who, I really enjoyed working with and I love talking to him and he enjoyed talking to me. We look forward to our sessions, but eventually at some point I said, Hey, you're doing a lot better. And I note that we're talking about things that are like this and not like the things that we used to talk about. Yeah. I'm wondering how you feel about therapy and if, uh, if you're ready to, uh, to graduate in a sense. And I think that's really liberating for clients to realize that therapy and, and, and uh, they often wait for the therapist to tell them they're fixed, but my job isn't to tell them they're fixed, but say, Hey, um, have we done enough with our time here? Are you ready to go on in life with what we've discussed? Yeah, completely. And uh, yeah, do you think the term fixed is an accurate term or would you say developed? Well, I say fixed only because oftentimes in a client's mind that I like it's going to the doctor. You go to the doctor and you get fixed. Uh, with us in therapy, I think it's more... Uh, uh, you developed a greater awareness or 
you've learned tools to help you manage your anxiety. For instance, anxiety is a perfect example. You don't go to a therapist and then leave without being anxious anymore. It just doesn't exist. What you do learn are tools to manage the anxiety and awareness of where the anxiety comes from and understanding of how anxiety affects your day-to-day life. And with those tools, then you can go live your life outside of therapy and manage the anxiety that is not going to go away, but is something you can incorporate and accept and then uh, hopefully live a happier life because of it. Absolutely, yeah. And I liked what you said about it might, it could, sometimes if they're not too interested, it can manifest and they're not showing up. I think it was either Carl Jung or Freud or maybe someone else, one of the, the big boys who said uh, the main precondition, and it's kind of obvious, the, the the biggest precondition to a therapeutic relationship is a willingness on the side of the... You, the patient has to accept that they need to come to therapy you know it's you know you can it's basically saying you can lead a horse to water but you can't make it drink it isn't going to work unless both parties are mutually uh aiming towards the same thing which obviously as a therapist you are but if the client isn't then that you're going to reach a stalemate there um so that that makes sense how because you know Obviously, there's. You must have had a, a. There must be something in you that was drawn to being a therapist because you know a screenwriter. I, I mean, it doesn't actually make more sense than thinking about it now because you're obviously interested in people and character and sort of narrative and that sense. Do you think it was? I've received a lot of help from therapists in my life, and I want to go on and help other people or do you think it was this is you saw it as an extension of being a screenwriter in a sort of sense in a, in a way what what do you think it was that where did that idea come from yeah there, there's certainly a lot of similarities between screenwriting and therapy yeah in that we're we're thinking about characters and i i do a lot of work on that i, I do a lot of lecturing i've written papers about be your character's therapist mm. uh, i think that's really interesting Personally, uh, and, and generally with people who become therapists, oftentimes it's a second career. It's a midlife chain. Yeah. And oftentimes it's also because people who have been through a lot in their life, who have been a college graduate and, and been a enlist and, and been in a relationship, they weren't sure that they were going to want to be out or, or had a parent die or gotten divorced or been a parent or quit their job. Yeah. Um, these are experiences that we learn and grow from and uh, specifically becoming a therapist. And also in general, I think people in later parts of their life realize that they have a lot of value and experience to share and wisdom of life with uh, people younger than them. So um, in my, in my um, cohort of uh, graduate school for psychology, you know, there were some younger people who were right out of college, but there were more people who were my age who had worked in entertainment and we're looking for a second career and realized they've always valued their own therapy experience and wanted to share their life's wisdom with their clients. I've never thought of it like that, actually. A 20-something-year-old that's straight out of, you know, university, what do they know about life? I mean, they've, you know, they've read the books and they, they understand CBT and, you know, obviously that's not the only type of therapy, but they don't have anywhere near as much life experience as someone who's, you know, as you said, has been through some of the things that you just listed yeah. out. And now that's not to say that, uh, that you shouldn't see a therapist who's younger than you or that younger therapists aren't as effective. That's certainly not the case, but a lot, that, I, not, not that you're implying that, but I want to make sure that I'm not quiet. But uh, in general, um, wisdom is a quality I think people seek out in a therapist. And to me, wisdom is the experience of life, not necessarily intelligence or smarts. It's I've been where you are and I made it through and I'm here to tell you that you can too. Yeah. And also maybe someone at different points or suffering with different difficulties could benefit from a different type of therapist. You know, you know, maybe there's someone who's slightly older and the wisdom is, you know, marinated more in their life and they have more of a calming sort of uh, elder sort of sage type uh, impact and then you've got someone who's a bit younger and all the information is very raw and they're very practical and you know scientific so to speak and they can you know chip chip chop your way through 
So yes, it, it completely yeah, depends. And in fact, you know, I, you know, I, 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 I'm a parent, I'm divorced. I, I share a lot with my clients about my experience in those areas. Yeah. Uh, I also have clients who come to me because of my screenwriting history. And oftentimes there are a lot of writers out there in this particular time in the industry who are struggling with whether they want to continue writing and uh, feeling burnt out and feeling like they're stuck at a dead end. And I, my marketing and my story on my website is all about, or partially about, my experience doing that. So that's a perfect example of somebody seeking out a therapist who has been in a particular situation and, and, and want guidance in that way. Yeah. Yes. I also forgot to say this introduction. You're an author of two books, aren't you? Dude, Where's My Catharsis? Brilliant name. Absolutely love it. And also, <laughs> is it Daddy, where, Dad, Where's My Blankie? Or Daddy, Where's My Blankie? Yeah. Well, let me tell you, I, I'm really milking that title for all, all its words. Dad, Where's My Blankie? It is a children's book I wrote about my kids. Yes. Uh, Dude, Where's My Catharsis is a nice. guide to uh, therapy in general. And then the sequel to that book, which I'm working on, is going to be called the same title, which the sequel to the movie was going to be called, which is Seriously, Dude, Dude Where's My Catharsis. Yes. And it's going to be a similar a similar thing. So while I don't uh, write screenplays anymore, I still enjoy writing. Yes. And do you, the therapy... This is kind of like, this is your USP, isn't it, really? How much has your screenwriting and your time in the industry impacted your therapeutic sort of process and philosophy? How have you incorporated? Right. Well... Big question. Well, certainly, I I work with many clients who specifically are writers and producers and comedians and performers in the industry. That's how I do. So, I'm intimate with the with the situation and in terms of trying to sell a pilot or dealing with a manager or getting notes on a draft so that's all practical stuff that i've i've experienced as a, in terms of my career um uh okay well what was the first part of your question uh, how do you question. like how have you incorporated your screenwriting ability and sort of talent in oh in oh right, right, right. Therapy? okay so th- yes this is interesting uh, because for instance like as a screenwriter uh, you learn that villains can be really interesting. In fact, uh, the point of the villain is not not just a bad guy. You want to understand what makes your villain tick. Yeah. In fact, there's a saying that you should make sure that your villain is the hero in his own movie. Yes. So he has his redeeming qualities, and you understand why he's doing what he's doing. Uh, in therapy, you know, it's not that my clients are villains, but I want to understand why my clients do what they do. Yeah. Um, if if I have a client who's who's sort of mean or not very friendly, um, I'm not going to think this guy's a jerk. I'm going to think I'm really curious about what this person has experienced growing up and uh, as he developed that made him the way that he is. So in both sense, it's about thinking about not what's on the surface of the character or the person, but what made them who they are, and then talking about that with them in therapy uh, to have a greater awareness of why you might do things that you don't want to do and understand the steps you can take to to change them and why it might be difficult based on your entire life's history of acting now yeah there's a how do i start this this is my head's just been going all it's going all over the place as you've been talking um so in the book in the book i'm i watched a series by it with a psychologist called john peterson i don't know if you heard of him he's a canadian guy and he did a book on the psychological significance of the bible and one of the first stories in the bible is the cain and abel story and it's how it's the two brothers you know and the the, the two adversaries and how cain both of them sacrifice things for god but abel's sacrifices aren't what would you say he's not rewarded for his sacrifice and cain is and then abel abel becomes angry and bitter and resentful then he and then he kills cain and god says you've um you've killed your own ideal and I basically can't help you at this point. You you've done you've committed the worst possible sin. And there that the point of that is that in the whole in the soul of every human is the battle between good and evil. And you, what you said earlier about how the villain, a great villain, is the hero of his own story. You that that's what separates a good villain from a bad villain. I think a bad villain is someone who you can almost empathize with ninety percent of the of the way but they just take it that 10% or they go about it the wrong way. So a great example is 
I'm a huge Spider-Man fan and I love the Raimi, the Sam Raimi, or the original ones. So both Peter Parker and uh, Norman Osborn have a reason to be aggrieved and upset. You know, Norman Osborn's had his company taken away from him and Peter Parker's, you know, his uncle's just died. But they've reached different conclusions out of it. Peter says, because there's a, there's a very, a very incredibly powerful scene in this. Sorry, if this is boring, just tell me to shut up. But there's a really good scene. No, I, I'm picturing it. Yeah. yeah, there's a really great scene in, and this is in all three of the, actually not the final, not the Tom Holland one, but the Garfield ones, where after the wrestling match, he goes and he gets his money and he says, the ad says 3,000. And the guy goes, okay, yeah, but you pinned him in two minutes, so you only get 200. And then the the guy that ends up killing Uncle Ben robs him, and he had the opportunity to stop the, 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 the mugger, but he didn't because he was annoyed, so he let him go. And that's kind of, that's the, the turning point of, of the character of Spider-Man, where he realises that if you let go of responsibility or you let your the bitter side of you take over things just get worse um i don't know where i was going with that but it was just when you were talking about the good well whereas well the interesting part with me is that i was thinking about the villain norman osborne who is so frustrated that he's not able to take over his dad's ideas or that his dad appreciates peter parker's intelligence yeah the way he yeah, his father would admire him, and so I'm so Peter Parker becomes right the object of his scorn. I mean, look, if, if Harry Osborn was in therapy, it would be a much different movie, right? Yes, because I would say to him, you know, what is it? What did people Peter Parker do? Why are you angry? Yeah, you're... where's that anger? Who who are you really angry? At? Yes, because Peter's really good at science, and yeah, and and Harry's not, and he's and that's kind of a big part of the film, isn't it? He's not really proud of him, so. I just oh, it, it's a father son. It, it's so ethical. It's it's like uh, Freud would have a field day. Yes, Freud would have a field day, wouldn't he? Yeah, yeah. yeah. When you're writing like that '70s show, an episode of that, how would you craft a narrative into a 20 minute sitcom? Was there like what would you? Well, the the process of of television writing is different. It's changed a little bit, but but generally, it's a staff. It's a group activity. You'll have a creator or a showrunner who is in charge of the show and various writers and producers in different uh, rankings and sort of the army of comedy. Um, and together on, on the 70s show, for instance, we would sit around a big table, make each other laugh for a while and then say, OK, let's get to work. And then we would start pitching ideas. And the, the show or I might say, you know, this season I want this to happen. And what are some good stories along that? Right? Okay. So people would pitch those stories. And then once we have enough note cards to fill a, a, a episode we work as a group to break those stories uh and then uh it would become once we had an outline it would be uh be one person's responsibility to actually go off and write the story and then after writing it come back and it would be sent back to the room and everybody would would chime in now that's much more collaborative than some shows some shows are very creative driven and they're written only by that person and sometimes the showrunner will really do most of the work themselves and use the staff for just a little bit of the, the dusting or heavy lifting. Uh, but on the 70s show, it was very collaborative and it was a hive mind. The only time you really got to do your own work individually was when you were off writing the script. Mm -hmm. But very quickly, I want to say that uh, ther therapists you know, go to school for psychology and they, they learn how to be a therapist and they learn uh, the different modalities. Uh, but we are individually our own businesses, mm. and so we have to market ourselves. Yeah. So oftentimes there's a niche or a specialty. And uh, for instance, I have a friend who's a therapist, and he came to this after a long career as a lawyer. Mm. And he got very burned out as a lawyer, yeah. and he didn't enjoy it anymore, and he decided to go into therapy. And now among his specialties are working with lawyers. Yeah. So if you're a lawyer and you're burned out and you happen to tell somebody you get a referral and you find a guy who used to be a lawyer, who was really burned out and now is a therapist. Exactly. That might be a natural fit for you. So people of all different professions often have a little bit of a niche in working with people who used to be or who, who are in the profession that they used to be in. Yeah. What sort of, I suppose you probably have already answered this, but what sort of things, putting your therapy head on, maybe separate from sort of screen. Yeah, there we go. Perfect. I can see it now. 
Um, what sort of things are people coming to you with issue? It's sort of in like in 2024, you know, answer as a therapist in the sense of what do you think are some of the things that people are struggling with nowadays? Well, Steve Clark, I mean, the classics are anxiety and depression, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and those are sort of the base for many things. Out of that can come anger, fear, shame, you know, the sub emotions out of those. And then we get into the specific reasons why they're anxious, uh, because they're not sure if they're going to get let go from their job and their mom can't afford to live on her own and her house is getting smaller and she might be getting divorced. I mean, they're all their reasons for anxiety that everybody has their unique, specific life experience. But uh, oftentimes we'll end up working on how to manage something. So people come to see you because of the specific story that they're uh, experiencing. And it's important to honor that. But it's also important to say, you know, in general, people in your situation often feel like that. Mm. And here's what people in your situation might often do to to try to uh, improve what they feel. Like. Yeah. What's it like in LA in, from a sort of mental health perspective? Bit of a vague question, but... It's beautiful. Is it? It's beautiful. Okay. Me from a mental health perspective, walking out your door to go for a walk and starting in the shade where it's a little crisp and cool and then walking out into the sunshine, which is warm and inviting and walking on the streets with palm trees and a clear blue sky. I mean, I love it. I mean, it, 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 on, a, on a certain level, it's a little superficial to say I'm here for the weather. But on an emotional level, it's important. I mean, I grew up in Texas, where uh, in the summertime, it was very humid, very hot. Yeah. The sun was not your friend. The sun, sun was something to be avoided. Yes. And you feel sticky and going from your car to your... It, I, I didn't enjoy it. And then when I moved here, uh, it's amazing how much the weather changed my mood. So when I work with clients who are in Los Angeles and they're feeling depressed or anxious, you know, we'll work through That's some great. of the issues from a mental health point of view, but also I'll often say, hey, Go out and take a walk. Put on your sunglasses, walk around the bluff, stand on the hill, feel the breeze. We live in an area with such beautiful weather. It's That vitamin D sometimes is better than an SSRI. Absolutely. Uh, Antidepressant. Yeah, yeah, no. Man, S, um, sun, vitamin D is and sunshine is sort of, uh, it's invariable. Well, I have to say, I know of so many Brits who moved to Los Angeles and they go out and they live by the beach and they get nice and tan yeah. and they're just soaking it all in. And for them, it seems like the weather is a big advantage. Are there a lot of therapists in Los Angeles? Is it a very therapy positive place? Yes. Yes, it is. I mean, uh, it's, a, it's a state that is so a little bit more liberal politics than uh, some of the more conservative parts of the country. And I think that people are more, people from that end of the spectrum are often more willing to be self uh, flexible, yeah, open, vulnerable, right? Um, in addition, the creative industries here often lend themselves to artistic people who are curious about their inner workings and want to work on themselves. In fact, oftentimes their work is a reflection of that. Mm. You know, I work with comedians whose material is drawn out of the same sort of self awareness that we uh, we talk about in therapy. Yeah. So uh, it's amazing when I have a client who's a comedian who who is doing a routine about the work of therapy because sometimes jokes are the best way to sort of express that kind of stuff. Absolutely. Uh, Humor is an incredibly invaluable asset, isn't it, when it's used correctly. And I, I was speaking to um, Paul Gill Martin. I don't know if you've heard of him, um, who did a... He was a comedian and he was on some program, some something dinner program or in the maybe early 2000s um, and he was talking about how comedy is such a huge that he believes that sort of you can't obviously you can but to have the, the level of awareness to be a comedian often brings with it the possibility of being an overthinker and, and maybe developing a bit of anxiety he'd suffered with he has he had suffered with a really bad alcoholism um, and he'd been sober as a result of going into therapy and he he's there's a podcast as well. What's your opinion on television series nowadays? 
Okay. No, I like this. I, uh, I enjoy, well, first, I don't watch the same kind of shows that I did back when I was writing. Yeah. The idea of a half hour sitcom that you tune in every week to laugh, I think it is just gone. It has gone to be funny. I enjoy, I enjoy a show like, for instance, Tokyo Vice. Mm -hmm. I think it was 10 episodes for a season. I really enjoyed it. Beginning, middle, and end. It was great. What I find then is that when, these shows that sort of are almost cinematic in their beginning, middle, and end of the season, uh, when they get extended, well, let's do another season, it doesn't quite work as well for me. I start to feel like the characters are doing things not because it's natural to what that character would do in the situation, but it's because it's what the writers needed them to do to create another season. Yes. Right. For instance, uh, a romantic, a romantic development between two characters in a second season is a great idea for writers because there's a lot of material there to write stories of. But would those two really become attracted to each other? Because sometimes I feel like in some series that might happen, but I'm not really buying it. And I can see the notes. Yes. I can see the executives and the producers saying, what could, well, what if, what if the bad guy turned out to be good? Well, that's a great narrative device. We could get a season out of it, but it doesn't always seem as natural as the, the original 10 episodes, which is, Oftentimes, the only shot that a current show has. Yeah. Because that must be quite a consideration, actually, when you're, you know, running a pilot and coming up with the television programs. How much long, how much longevity does this idea have? You know, you take something like, uh, obviously, Friends that had 10 years worth of longevity, fair enough. And another one that I used to watch growing up, uh, Modern Family, which is actually pretty big in the U in the UK, to be fair. That's got, you know, there's a hope for that to be, you can take that to multiple different places and, you know, because families change and develop over time. But there must be some, there's probably examples of television series out there that were really good, but they just got sort of cancelled or whatever the correct terminology is because they just thought we can't really take this any further forward because that is such an, maybe the word is niche. It's a niche idea. Maybe not. Well, you know, at a certain point, everybody on Friends had slept with each other. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, well, well I guess we've exhausted that well. Right. Very true. Um, and and, and in, in the, back in the day with the syndication model, when the goal was to get 200 episodes and then sell that into the syndication markets, you were just looking to extend it. What could we do this year? What can we do this season? Uh, where some of these shows, um, like I'll go back to Tokyo Vice just because it's on my mind. So, spoiler alert. Uh, you know, the guy who plays the reporter uh, in the second season becomes romantically involved with the woman who was the uh, uh, the mistress of the, the main bad guy. And it just never felt right to me. And honestly, it might be part of a book or pre-existing material that was all, always like that. But it always felt like something to me like the character wouldn't do. And in fact, that's a lot of the work that I do with screen artists sometimes is when characters do things that you don't think they would do. And jeopardy. how 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 satisfying is on the other hand when a character does something that you know that they would do even though you don't like the result. Mm -hmm. I mean that's to me the difference between really great great TV or film and and something that feels more pr produced or, or uh, workshopped in a way to 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 facilitate the, the existence of the show. So would you say that it's more important to write narratives and plots? that are conducive and make sense with the character, pre-existing character, than, I guess, interesting. Or Obviously, it's a balance, isn't it? But you, you can't sacrifice character well, or wow factor. Yes. In fact, let me, let me define it more clearly. Uh, as a screenwriter, I when I was uh, working, I, I always wanted to have a very good outline. I wanted to know exactly which character would do what, have the plot all worked out. Um, and then when I wrote it, if I got a note like, I don't know if the character would do that, would they really do that? I would be like, yeah, but listen, I, it, it sets up this thing at the end, so let's just make it work. Um, and that sometimes would develop uh, shows where you characters would do things that you don't really think that they would do. That sort of takes me out of it as a viewer. Um, the more courageous, braver thing is to go into it with a little bit more unknown and not be sure what the character is going to do. And in, in a way, let the character tell you, which... When I was starting out as a screenwriter, I always thought that was bullshit. Like, I, characters aren't going to tell me what to do. I, I'm going to tell the character what I need them to do. But 
Uh, in the same way that in therapy, we often might come in with an idea of what we want to talk about. But if we really can be open to anything, we might find ourselves exploring something that we never thought would be the goal of therapy. And that might not be very satisfying and rewarding. Same thing with uh, with characters in a script or a play or a movie or a TV show where uh, if you free them up to do what you really think they would do, even if it throws a monkey wrench into your production plans, uh, theoretically, that would be more satisfying for me than a neat, happy ending that was decided upon before the, the writing would take place. Yeah. Because one of the things that we do when we um, watch a movie is we kind of mimic our nervous system, and that's I suppose that's what acting is, isn't it? It's the it's the the act of embodying a character, and when you're writing just what you were saying, when you're writing a script, you also probably end up embodying the character, and therefore you have to the character may inform you, as in no this is what i would do now and you know your logical brain says well you know you do this but maybe the character's saying or there's a gut feeling or some sort of sensation that says you would do this and maybe when you when you're in therapy with someone there's that same sort of process going on of you get into the mind of your client and there you can act as a conduit for their mm -hmm. um what's the word Curing is not the right word, but their progression or their their opening. No, yeah. In fact, um, the uh, an exercise sometimes I, I I would do as a screenwriter that I work with my screenwriting clients is to have the character who your main character or your villain, and take them out of the, what you're working on and put them in a scene where they are at dinner on their first date and the waiter's a real jerk. And just write write that scene. It has nothing to do with the, the that's script cool. And that's a way to sort of get into the character more. And in the same way, in therapy, a, a, a client might go on a tangent, let's say, and talk uh, be talking about something and then realize that they're talking about something else. And then they'll often apologize to say, I'm so sorry I went off on a tangent there. And I'll say, no, 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 this is great. Yes. Let's keep going where this tangent goes. Because oftentimes the tangent leads us back to something that forms the reason why we're here in the first place, which we would never have considered if we hadn't been open to that. That's why Freud used to get his clients to sit on a couch and to face away from him. It's so that they would speak and they would engage in this meandering process and they wouldn't be sort of informed or persuaded by his facial expressions and they would just... Because that's kind of a skill to learn to, to not... I mean, a good therapist actually knows how to lead their client in a, in a good way but he he wanted them to it's that i think jung called it circumambulation where you walk around the point that you before but it take people can't go straight there they have to skirt around it before they can get yeah. inside yeah yeah freud uh, also had terrible acne and he was very embarrassed so that's why he wanted their client to not look at him very good yeah yeah that's that's that yeah that better, better reason actually yeah and and, uh, and Jung just liked to talk a lot so he just or he just liked to listen so he just let people go on yeah. and unnecessarily you said you had a really good um dog with a blog story oh yeah um so uh as part of my job as a screenwriter is to you know, pitch ideas, work on shows, do that kind of work. But in addition, you're always creating your own kind of stuff. And uh, oftentimes, uh, the silliest, funniest idea that a writer would write that they think no one would buy would be a good thing to have in their quiver. So I wrote a talking dog show, and it was very blue. It was R-rated. It was it was if, uh, uh, yeah, it was the odd couple, but the messy, slovenly one was a dog. And there was a lot of cussing. There was sex jokes. There was drug use. The dog was a, smoked weed all the time, and like Ted, and poop all over the place. Y yeah, exactly, exactly. And the idea was, a, I, I'll be a meeting at Warner Brothers or Fox, and they'll talk about, man, why don't we have a really funny, dirty talking dog show? And I'd be like, well, why don't you read this? Uh, now the irony is that when that happened. Uh, I was helping some friends that were working on a Disney Channel show, a child show, 
And that's when the executive said, you know, we're doing a talking dog show. And I said, well, that's perfect. I have the perfect script for you, except it's completely yeah. long, except for the talking dog yeah. part. So, um, but uh, suffice to say, they read the script. I guess they were, they had comments that I could write a talking dog. And um, they already had the title, Dog with a Blog. Amazing title. Like the greatest. Um, but that the irony was that I, I written something that was so blue and dirty that I, I couldn't wait for somebody to ask for it, but it was the cleanest, most prime uh, uh, network that would actually uh, end up wanting to uh, to do a show like that. Or a, a talking dog show. No. Yeah. What, what was it like working with Disney Channel? Was it cool? Well, you know, the Disney Channel was a, a place where they were still doing a lot of multi-camera sitcoms for kids back when multi-camera sitcoms were starting to disappear from network television. First, uh, single-camera shows like Malcolm in the Middle started, uh, Wonder Years became more popular, and reality shows squeezed that as well. So a lot of people in my generation who were multi-camera writers on Friends, uh, 70s show, Mad About You, those kind of shows, transitioned to doing the same kind of format on the Disney Channel. Um, so it was an interesting sort of child version of the joke setup, joke punchline kind of situation that we had come up with writing for those kind of multi-camera shows for adults. When you say, mo what's the difference between, I mean, obviously I understand multi-camera, but what what does that actually mean, multi-camera and single camera? Right. Well, multi-camera refers to the fact that there are three cameras, sometimes four. And in addition, that show like that is taped on a stage in front of a live audience. So it's more like a play. You're playing to a live audience. The characters come out and they stand at 45 degrees to the background and to the audience. And they know that the three cameras are on them and they deliver their lines. The block is very important. Um, versus a single camera show like Malcolm in the middle, uh, where it's filmed on a stage still, but there's no audience. There's no stage to... There's no audience to face. It's much more cinematic and, and like a, a movie. Uh, and it's a different style of both yeah. acting and producing in terms of not having audience. Yeah, yeah. So the Friends is would be one of the, the three, the three, the three camera ones. And they've got a, it's like a, a multi yeah, the multi camera. Right. Yeah, yeah. And it's, there's only like a few sets and they just sort of switch back and forth. It's fifth. We've we've gone for fifty seven minutes, so I don't want to take up too much of your time. But I do want to ask a little bit about your own experiences in therapy and how they helped you overcome the things that you were going. I don't know a piece of advice that you were given, or you know, we've already touched on obviously you as a therapist. But what about you as someone seeking therapy and? What did it get for you to go to see a therapist? I, I think my therapy experiences throughout my life were situations where verbalizing, saying out loud how I felt to somebody else really helped me become more aware of it, helped me process it, and then to to essentially get over it. Um, going to a therapist and talking about how depressed you are and how sad you are might not be the cure, but it certainly made me feel a lot yes. better than not doing it. It's sort of like the idea of, you know, people feel much better after they mm. cry. And uh, in the same way, people often feel much better after they unburden themselves from all the things that they've been thinking about, about how they feel. Um, and on a certain level, it's even hard to do that because many people have the blinders off and team even acknowledging their pain or their, their traumatic history or or the things about themselves that they don't like. Um, so there are a lot of levels to that. But basically what I got out of it was just very, very simple. It's There was no no life coach hack, no acronym-based approach that fixed me. Simply the act of being with another person you trust and talking about these things and getting support and acknowledgement of it is, is very therapeutic and can help yeah, a lot. Because the actual act of thinking is actually incredibly ineffective. We, you know, we have to talk and write things down for us to truly process things which obviously you're very well versed in writing things down so your brain works well in that sense but you have to but that that's another reason why uh journaling is a very yeah. popular that, intervention yeah. for people who are experiencing uh just the idea of 
writing something down and then being able to go back and read it and be like, yeah, I really felt like that. Uh, something about the externalization of that yes. helps. I had a guy on the podcast who said that he journals at least an hour every day, but he said it's in, it's changed his life. So it is is just journaling, talking are better forms of thinking than thinking itself is. Hence why you go to someone and you engage in a dialogical relationship and you get that back and forth, don't you? In the same way that when you were writing a script. Although, although the, 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 the journaling, I'm going to pronounce his wrong, his name wrong, but it's Samuel P E P Y S S Samuel Pe Peps, the, the, the famous English naturalist and philosopher. I don't know. Samuel Pep. Pep. Um, he, he was famous for, for his, he was he's famous for writing a, a diary and it's, you know, you can actually read it. It's his entire life. But it's really very rote. It's about what he did that day and where he went and who he had tea with, as opposed to what we might talk about more journaling yeah. or we're talking about how we're feeling, you know, really expressing like a little more intimately. Or, or, yeah, it's like a, a, a direct recount, isn't it? Which has probably got some benefit, to be fair. I mean, if you're someone who, you know, when a, uh, a very random side note, but when a, like a gazelle is chased by a, a lion in the, in the wild, 